Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. Devoted to the business of purveying food and decanting wines, Food & Wine Radio is a unique program highlighting not food recipes or wine vintages, but how to make a profit while satisfying America's palates. In this competitive but highly rewarding sector, many men and women have made profits while fulfilling a dream. Food & Wine Insider is all about better managing any business involving food & wine. Each week, your co-hosts sit down with successful restaurateurs, food mavens, winery vendors, store owners, food suppliers, and other leaders in the worldwide industry that centers on foodstuff and wine. In frank give-and-take sessions, guests and panelists talk about the business of bringing healthy and pleasurable foods and wines to others. Your Food & Wine radio host, R. Ann Daw, former president of the Specialty Food Association and a longtime food executive who has held senior positions both here and abroad with Kraft Foods and Philip Morris. Don Mazella, a nationally known business commentator. On each show, they invite leaders of the world's culinary and wine industries to share the secrets of their success. Visit us at foodandwineinsider.com. Ann Dow's guest is the founder of the Chef Action Network, Catherine Miller. She has been called one of the most creative women in the food and wine industry. Now she has just combined with the James Beard Foundation. Catherine, welcome to the program. Tell us about your foundation and your website. Sure. Hi. Thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Catherine Miller, and I'm the exec founding executive director of the Chef Action Network, and I'm also now the senior policy director at the James Beard Foundation. Uh, the James Beard Foundation, as many know, is a venerable organization. We're the givers of all the restaurant awards and best restaurants and best chefs and best chefs Southwest and uh uh, just about a year ago, they uh, I had been working with the James Beard Foundation for a while uh, through my role as the, with the Chef Action Network, and about a year ago, we decided to join forces. And so we've been, the Chef Action Network was founded on the premise that uh, chefs are amazing small business leaders in most cases, business people, community leaders, cultural leaders, many call them the new rock stars, and we wanted a way to get those rock stars, those trusted sources of information about our food, I'm more involved in helping shape our food system and helping shape policies around our food system. So the Chef Action Network trains chefs to be better advocates. It helps support chefs who are interested in taking on uh, long-term policy and practice changes, and it helps um, partner those organizations, uh, those chefs with leading organizations around the country working on issues such as reducing food waste, sustainable seafood, um, defining what is sustainable meat, working on continuing advancements in child nutrition. And, and then again, about a year ago, we partnered with the James Beard Foundation to take that um, work to a broader audience. So thanks for having me. It's fun. Catherine, um, I, could you talk a little bit about your background um, and then uh, somewhat, what inspired you to create the uh, Chef Action Network? Yeah, my background is entirely in advocacy and training and building campaigns and spokespeople to help advance what seem like intractable causes in the world. So I spent um, about a decade working directly on various political campaigns around the country. I then went into the corporate world and worked on the intersections of where we bring large-scale finance and corporate entities into the mix to work on some of the problems that face us. And then I um, transferred that knowledge into work with a major nonprofit organization called the United Nations Foundation, which was founded by uh, the CNN founder and global philanthropist Ted Turner, um, really to work on some of the largest issues such as uh, preventing malaria, helping empower women and girls around the world, uh, helping eliminate things like, um, uh, helping create things like the Clean Cook Stoves Initiative. So really those big problems. And, you know, I was really inspired to start the Chef Action Network through my relationship with two really great mentors, um, Chef Michelle Nishan 
who is from Connecticut, who has spent decades uh, working in restaurants and developing really socially responsible and sustainable uh, cooking initiatives, developed and founded Wholesome Ways, which we can certainly happy to talk about. And then also Eric Kessler, who is a founder of Arabella Philanthropic Advisors, uh, one of the leading uh, companies to advise every major philanthropist in the world on how to better spend their better spend and direct their resources. And those two men came to me with a proposition, which was, hey, you have all this great experience. We'd love you to um, come and train some chefs that we've picked um, to be better advocates. And so they really selected me as the trainer uh, for what is now called the Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change, which is a five-year initiative. And after that first training, the penny sort of dropped. This idea that chefs are leaders, chefs are artists, chefs are um, consumers themselves, and how to take the high level of trust and engagement that they have within their communities and turn that into sort of a force for good. So um, it's been a pretty amazing journey over the last five years. And... Um Beyond the um, the initial group that they got involved in in being trained, how how do you get chefs to uh, be knowledgeable about what you do and get involved in what you're doing? Yeah, I mean the chefs are pretty excited just even from the first one in July 2012 that the James Beard Foundation piloted and Chef Michelle Nishan and Eric Kessler founded and then brought me in to do the training. The chefs were pretty excited even then about this idea that they were being recognized outside of the kitchen. Um, word of mouth spread really quickly. Um, after that first uh, chef boot camp for policy and change, the James Beard Foundation decided they wanted that to be an official program of the foundation. And so we worked together to build it. And we've now done, uh, we just completed our 14th uh, chef boot camp for policy and change. We've trained over 200 chefs. Um, and we have about 800 folks on the waiting list for that program. So some of that's been word of mouth. Some of that's been great publicity um, about the program. And, you know, much of it has also been about the nonprofit organizations that like to work with chefs, seeing what they're doing on Capitol Hill or in their state legislators and saying that we need more. So we've completed these trainings. We have now launched programs in different communities. So we've been to Phoenix and Seattle and Raleigh and Los Angeles and Sacramento and Arkansas and Atlanta. And uh, it's been really exciting to see the chefs really step into this role as community leaders and decide to do this and then share it with their friends and share it with their peers. So it's been a great credit to them as a community. No, that's, it's really awesome. Could you, um, I was curious because I read some of the work on uh, from the Chef Action Network. Can you describe what happens in the Chef Boot Camp? It sounds intense. Uh, <laughs> in terms of what happens. Of course. It's a, you know, it is a pretty intense program. It's the James Beard Foundation Chef Boot Camp for Policy and Change. It's a three-day invitation-only retreat. Um, applicants apply, and there's a selection process. Uh, it's 15 chefs at a time, ideally. Uh, any bigger than that gets a little crazy. And, and it's three parts. One, it's relationship building. So they spend a lot of time. It's just us and the chefs. There's not a lot of outside guests, maybe a speaker or two, maybe some folks um, come to one of the dinners. But largely it's them and the staff from myself and then from the Beard Foundation. We spend uh, a sort of a half a day getting to know each other, a lot of conversation over dinner, over um, over fire pits, just uh, casually getting to know each other. And then they move into a full day of classroom exercises, stuff that many who do trainings related to advocacy might recognize, um, how to how to talk about the causes that they care about in ways that bring people to the table, how to um, identify decision makers in their community, the people who they need to reach out to in order to make change happen, um, identifying the issues that they want to work on. Um, and that could range from the issues that the Beer Foundation is aligned with, such as reduction of food waste or introducing sustainable seafood or meat into your menus. It could be other things that are more workplace um, intense. So, 
each for us, each boot camp has a theme. We just came from one in Shelburne Farm where we spent a day talking about the Farm Bill, the largest piece of food legislation in the country. Um, so they get some lectures, some interact um, interactive discussions. They do brainstorming. They do a great exercise where they build a, a campaign, so to speak, themselves and get to practice some of their creativity. And then we introduce them to the farm. We're always on a working farm. So we introduce them to the farm practices, had a, um, some maybe some new introductions around food waste production strategies or sustainable soil. Um, and then we do a lot of stuff talking about where our food comes from. So a lot of on-farm discussions about animal husbandry, or in one case, we went to um, an ocean side and did a lot of discussion around sustainable seafood. So, you know, it's, it's getting to know each other, it's building new skills, it's introducing new concepts related to the kitchen and purchasing. And I think the fourth most important thing that we do with them, and this is the close, the third day, is really talk about their intentions after they leave. Um, for us, the biggest thing that they can give us is the gift of uh, is is a gift of doing something. They all say thank you. It's mind blowing. It's amazing. They love it. And our big message is it doesn't mean anything unless you don't go out and actually do something in your community outside of the kitchen. And so that's um, so we spend a lot of time on the last day, sort of talking about that and identifying things that they might do after they leave. What do they uh, typically commit to, uh, Catherine? What are the kinds of things you tend to hear that they, they're they going to go back and, and do straight away? Because I think that's a very important point is could be all wonderful and exciting and it's, you know, you go to a seminar and then you don't put anything into the action. What are the, what are the types of commitments that they, that they tend to make? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is they always commit to learning more. They come away with you know, just basic information about an issue that we introduced them to, the first step in their skills building. And so I, I've been so excited to see everybody take the take the step even more than that and get to know the issues more, introduce themselves to the nonprofit organizations working on the issues that they are interested in. I'm, I'm always really excited that they make a commitment to take it back to their staff. Um, so they do in-house training to introduce what they've learned and the idea that they're more than just pretty people be with sharp knives behind hot stoves, that they are actually leaders in their communities. And so this idea that um, they take it back to their staff is always really huge and um, rewarding for us. The third thing that I am always excited that most do is that they make a promise to go meet their mayor or a member of Congress or introduce themselves to the people who are already coming into their restaurants who are working on policy and practice. Um, you know, one thing that we've recognized about chefs and restaurants is these people, the people we all want to reach, our governors, our president, our senators, our mayors, they're already coming into the restaurants in their local communities. And so it doesn't have to be political, and we certainly don't want it to be partisan, but it is always nice to let people know that you're watching and you're looking and you're paying attention to what they're doing. And in many cases, encouraging them to do more. Um, so that's, you know, we're always excited that they take the extra steps in education and training, that they take it out to their staff, and that they introduce themselves to someone in their community that can help them make a difference. And then there are bigger things. We've seen people create nonprofits, and we've seen people, you know, take on big roles and come to Washington repeatedly. So, but, you know, those are sort of the three entry steps, I would say. And um, could you could you? That, it's really fantastic, and I and I think that level of commitment is really fabulous. Um, do you do you? What do you do to follow up with them once they've been through the boot camp? Uh, do you have any sort of feedback model that uh, understands what they've been able to do, the kinds of things that they've instituted? Can Can you describe any of that? Yeah, so that was really, in some ways, the impetus for the Chef Action Network. When they, we hosted the first boot camp in July of 2012, we didn't necessarily have a plan for what we would do afterwards, right? It was just an idea. And they all looked at us and they said, well, what do you want us to do now? And who do we call? And that was truly some of the, you know, the, some of the reason that we created the Chef Action Network to kind of keep that momentum moving. Since that, it's been you know much more formal. We have Facebook groups, both public and private, where the chefs can talk to each other, but where we also post articles. 
we send out now with James Beard a monthly newsletter to every attendee plus um, interested folks. We send I send personal emails, a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact. We've also, with James Beard, started to integrate the chef programming into all of our events. Uh, we host 150, somewhere to 190 events a year at the James Beard House with different chefs every night. So we use that now as an education point between our staff and the chefs. We also um, host events around the country with our uh, Taste of America and Celebrity Chef Tours, and so those have become vehicles to talk about this work. And then we've also instituted a number of new programs under the Beard umbrella through our Impact Program. So now we now do culinary labs where we take those out into the community to teach basic skills that maybe have been lost, butchery, whole animal butchery, um, whole seafood butchery, uh, sustainable agriculture, and then we also have what we call issue summits where we um, go to a city and invite chefs in. So we've now this year, I was I literally was just this last week in both um, Louisville talking about sustainable meat and then on the West Coast talking about sustainable seafood. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of your new techniques, you know, social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, traditional stuff, newsletters monthly regular contact and then a lot of individual contact one-on-one -on -one, and then in the to the community themselves awesome um don did we need to take a break right now or before i asked another question i was just about to say uh, it's just time to take a brief break break to hear from one of our sponsors dan perkins here from recalculating.biz with your featured book i want to tell you about a recent interview i had with bob bethel turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. We're back here with Catherine Miller. She's uh, the founder of the Chef Action Network, and which is now associated with the very prestigious James Beard Foundation. And we're back uh, here with our host, Ann Dahl. Okay, Catherine, um, I, I was wondering as you were talking about um, the programs, the, you know, even in terms of how to uh, manage uh, meat products and, and the whole area of sustainability and so on and education. Um, I was wondering if James Beer or you folks have been doing anything with the, uh, the CIA, the Culinary Institute or Johnson and Wales at the education level, um, getting chefs sort of who are starting out to really understand sort of their role in the whole food sustainability area. Yeah, I mean, we work really closely with all of the culinary institutions around the country from, you know, those that are at community colleges to those that are, you know, CIA and others. It's, it's the next generation is some of the most important. We're in the process, we're right in the middle of the process of developing a curriculum or a, a program for culinary instructors so that they can start to integrate sustainability, um, starting with food waste, how to reduce food waste, um, into the culinary curriculum. These aren't actually, at this moment, and the things that you're being taught, right? Culinary school focuses on flavor and on technique. And so we are trying to work with all the culinary institutions, but particularly culinary professionals, the instructors, to have the materials that they need, the information and expertise that they need, but then they can integrate it into the classroom um, more holistically and easily. So that is a big focus of our work for the coming years um, is on that. And we hope that the initial pilot program, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, 
which is focusing on the reduction of food waste, that we will then be able to use that platform to talk about sustainable seafood, to talk about sustainable meat, to talk about butchery practices, all of those things. So yeah, it is um, probably, you know, the next generations are most important. So we're trying to look for ways to both partner and then develop new things to fill some gaps. So if you were, you were in front of um, students or, you know, maybe it's kids coming out of high school to say, gee, I really would love a culinary career. I want to be a chef. Um, you know, I'm thinking about not only, you know, where to go to school, learn all the things that I need to learn. What is it that you would say to them? Um, I think first and foremost, I'd say is that being a chef is, is an amazing opportunity, but it means you're going to probably work harder than anyone. <laughs> um, and it means that you're going to need to use all of your skills, not just great cooking, but how to run a sustainable business, you know, um, and how to create family and community for your team so that they're there. Um, so it is more than just um, a, sort of a celebrity culture. It is a it is a unique and highly skilled profession and that also you have to know how to do all the other things that um, make it successful. And so it's, I would encourage everyone to sort of think about it in the fulsome way that way. You know, one thing about this next generation is they're much more attuned to the issues of sustainability or um, questions around climate change or um, things related to putting you know, vegetables at the center of the plate versus proteins. They're so much more aware of these things than, you know, even the two or three generations before them. And so for them, it's how do you do that creatively? How do you do that in a way that's exciting and interesting? And then also how do you sustain a family or a community off those things? And so we really want to focus on the whole picture related to the chef. Um, and you know, take the emphasis maybe a little away from you know being just a celebrity, right? Um, yeah. Because I think that there's a there's a healthy notion that I'm gonna go to culinary school, I'm gonna open a restaurant, and I'm gonna become famous. And um, the reality is, you're gonna go to culinary school, you're gonna open a restaurant, and you're gonna work harder than anyone else around you. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, and work lots of hours and have back problems. <laughs> of that. And you're gonna, and you're gonna work uh, lots of hours, and you know you're gonna, you know, and it's gonna be hard. And that doesn't mean you won't end up on the cover of a magazine. It doesn't mean you won't be doing the morning talk shows in your local community. It just knowing that those are the types of things that you need to think about: how to run a sustainable business, how to, and by that I mean financially sustainable how to build relationships within your community so that you have access to the best ingredients um, or the most thoughtful ingredients, how to make those relationships globally so that you can stay on top of trend and know what you, you know, know what you don't even know yet about what's coming from around the, around the world related to taste and flavor. I mean, there's just so much about it and, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful profession so highly skilled, it's so um, thoughtful, so creative, and so um, it's really inspiring. And on the other end, I mean, celebrity, being a celebrity can bring attention to issues better than sometimes just, you know, folks trying to do things uh, clearly in their local communities, which they should be doing anyway. Um, have, have you found any of the celebrities who are embracing this and uh, obviously, there's you know uh, Dan Barber at you know uh, uh, Stone Barnes, and there's there are a few out there who really um, embrace the whole food sustainability and reduction of waste. Are there are there ones that you find are 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 good spokespersons um, to influence people on a broader scale? Yeah, I mean, I think the most exciting thing for us has been identifying those chefs who are um, famous or well-known or reputable within their own communities. Uh, not, you know, in 20 plus years of doing advocacy work, 
there are organizations that would love to have spokespeople in every community, um, but it costs too much to, to get them and you can't find them. And we're, we have them. They're sitting in our professional network. You know, these are the people that are on WUSA Channel 9. These are the people that are on, you know, on their local um, radio shows. These are, and they may not be as known to the high, um, the, the, more, uh, the more known booties like Dan Barber or Tom Clicchio or Jose Andres. Um, but I look at them and they are so powerful. Uh, Andrea Rusing, a chef in North Carolina, um, can get on the front page of every paper in North Carolina when she decides to talk to it about an issue. Or Renee Erickson, a chef in Seattle, talking about sustainable seafood. They are real leaders um, and they might not have the level of international or um, national notoriety or celebrity but they are celebrities in their own right, in their own communities. And so we've been really excited even to see some folks like Hugh Atchison's come through our program, Sean Brock's come through our program, um, Mary Sue Milliken, Emily Lucchetti, some of these more iconic names in the um, food world have come through the program and been very excited um, and run with the sort of information we've given. So, uh, you know, I look at the Dan Barbers and the David Changs and the April Bloomfields as influencers and leaders and really on the cutting edge of, you know, sort of what's happening in food. I look at the, you know, Mary Sue Millikins and the Tom Clicchios and the Jose Andres as, as those who are working every day in the industry and in larger in large scale um, who are then using their voice on specific policies. And then I look at the Andrea Rusings and the Renee, Renee Erickson's and um, the Jennifer Bookers and the Asha Gomez's of the world, all women, all women around the country who are well known within their communities and, you know, and rising. So. I think, you know, the point you made earlier about also working with the not for profits, I know Jose Andres, uh, you know, he works with DC Kitchens and puts people who might not, in fact, uh, be able to be employable, puts them puts them to work, and um, he's done some really uh, phenomenal things. So I, I love what you were saying about sort of that hand in hand uh, with uh, the social consciousness and the non for profit. As you think about the last five years, I think you said um, the uh, Chef Action Network has been uh, in place for about five years. We're talking with Catherine Miller. Uh, the founder of the, the Chef Action Network. Catherine, please tell us uh, your website one more time. Sure. For anybody who's interested, you can visit us at, actually at www.chefaction.org or via the James Beard Foundation website. Um, and we're on Twitter at JBF Chef Action. We were speaking with Catherine Miller who is the founder of the Chef Action Network. A link to her website will be up on www.foodandwineinsider.com's site tonight. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Bethel 
Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. You are listening to Ann Daw and Don Mazella, and the program is Food and Wine Insider. If you have a question or know someone you think our listeners should hear, contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Remember, our programs are heard every Wednesday and Saturday on this station via amfm247.com or on iHeartRadio, as well as Roku Television. You can listen to past shows at foodandwineinsider.com. For 30-plus years, Glacier Foods have been feeding guests at restaurants and catered events throughout the country. Here to, here to talk about his vast experience and ideas is Matthew Glazier, president of Glazier Works. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the program. Hello, good. Hi, how are you today? Hi, Matthew. Hello. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Um, thank you for be- thank you for being on the on the show. And um, I would uh, I'd love to just have you start to talk a little bit about uh, any key factors that affect. You've been in high end restaurants, and any key factors that you feel affect the high end restaurants that you would advise have other restaurant tours to really pay attention to. Some details that. that sort of say, hey, it's not just about X, Y, Z, but you really need to pay attention to ABC and what that would be from your perspective. Well, uh, I got to focus on ABC, not X, Y, Z. But, uh, you know, I, I think when, when you were asking the question, what was, what was jumping into my mind is providing an experience that guests can't get elsewhere. Um, I think uh, in any business, especially restaurant business, there's a certain entertainment uh, aspect. But I, I think it's all about the food and service. Uh, and, you know, plenty of restaurants, especially in Manhattan where we're based, spend millions of dollars on the build-out um, to provide the atmosphere. But once the customers come and seen your build-out, seen your atmosphere, seen the, the physical, you know, element and the design, if the food and service isn't great, they don't have to come back because they've already seen it. You need to provide something that they can't get anywhere else and that, you know, drives them back into the, you know, butts and seats, I guess. Absolutely. Okay, you know, um, you started your career uh, very differently. Uh, certainly, uh, you you have a, a, a law degree, and now you're a restaurateur. At the beginning of your career, could you have ever imagined any of this? And um, could you talk a little bit about how how important actually your legal background has been to managing um, the restaurant businesses that you do? Well, you know, first of all, I, I grew up in the restaurant business. So, you know, it really wasn't all that far-fetched that I would once again return into the restaurant business. I think a lot of people would agree that the restaurant business disease might not be the great, greatest word for it. But once you have it in your blood, the hospitality element, um, you know, uh, it drives you to, there's something about it, the action, the excitement, the creativity, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, I always crave that even when I was practicing law at a large law firm. I think, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate how relevant a law degree is to, to the restaurant business or, or any business nowadays. Um, I can just think of, uh, you know, for example, like an insurance policy, you know, just, just reading an insurance policy, even in being an attorney is a difficult task. Um, everything is, is very detailed. Uh, in New York, just the amount of laws in New York City, um, you know, it, it's just very helpful to have that degree. And, and what have you seen has changed in terms of either regulations for restaurants? It's, I mean, there must be a lot of changes over the last 30 years. What's, what's become more difficult in terms of the regulations? A tool. Without talking about the financial aspect, just the regulatory aspect is uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, in New York City now, uh, there's mandatory sick leave. Um, in New York City now, they've changed the law that you can't even ask uh, a potential employee their salary history. Um, this is just all stuff that's in the past couple of years. But, you know, the way I look at it in my mind is, we started, you know, two, three hundred years ago with, with, with no laws, and every year you add, 
you know, legislative session of laws, and you also have, you know, uh, judicial laws, you know, the, the, the courts, through the courts. So every year, you know, more and more laws and more and more regulations, um, you know, uh, now they're also, you know, talking about additional regulatory stuff in New York City. So, you know, it's just, it, it's a lot. It truly is. Wonderful. You've owned a lot of really fabulous properties. And as you said earlier, you know, you, you, you go for that unique experience for your guests um, and the unique characters of your restaurants. Could you talk a little bit about some of the different um, styles and characters and experiences you have brought forth through your restaurants? Uh, you know, Michael Jordan Steakhouse and Grand Central Terminal, um, you know, about 17, 18 years ago when uh, the state of New York and Metro North Railroad uh, spent, you know, basically a fortune renovating the terminal. It was one of the biggest, you know, tourist attractions in New York. Um, and we have what is considered by us and many, you know, wonderful classic steakhouse there. Um, but the real key for us is once you've seen the terminal, you don't have to go back to see the terminal again. So, you know, that, that's kind of what I was saying is you have to deliver the product so that they come back for that. We've had, uh, you know, we created a brand called Strip House, which uh, we later sold, which had five or six uh, units around the country. And um, we used a very famous architect named David Rockwell who did the design. Um, and it was really, you know, a 1920s or 30s speakeasy type of book. Um, we had a, a restaurant called Monkey Bar, which was around since the 1920s and 1930s. Um, you know, a lot of classic brands, um, you know, that evoke a certain uh, feeling from, you know, a time of years past that is very different from the time we live in now, almost like Mad Men era type stuff. Um, mm. But it goes into that first question again. Once you've been there and seen it, unless you deliver, they're not coming back. Absolutely. Now, when you, you've sold several restaurants, as, as you just mentioned, when you do so, why do you? That, is it always a different reason? When Hopefully you that addresses the question. As you were talking about, you know, the uh, the characters of your businesses and so on, I, I, would, I think our listeners would love to know, when you sell a restaurant, why do you sell a restaurant? What what is what what's the what's going on when you're when you're doing that? I imagine it's a different reason for each property. But could you talk a little bit about um, when you make that decision to sell? Why you why you have done so? It's a complicated question. There's many reasons that go into it. You know, a lot of times somebody makes an offer, um, and you weren't even thinking about selling it, and it becomes the appropriate. You know, it, it, it right away becomes the time to sell. Um, you know, you want to focus on something new. You feel like you put as much into the project as you can. And it's time for somebody to uh, somebody else to run with it. Um, there's just a lot of reasons. You know, each one had its own reason. And we need to stop a moment to hear from our sponsors. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. You are listening to Ann Daw and Don Mazella, and the program is Food and Wine Insider. If you have a question or know someone you think our listeners should hear, contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Remember, our programs are heard every Wednesday and Saturday on this station via amfm247.com or on iHeartRadio, as well as Roku Television. You can listen to past shows at Food and Wine Insider. Dot com. We're talking with Matthew Glazier about creating and running a restaurant and catering establishments throughout the country. Um, obviously, location is very important. What are the other What are the other things that you're looking for? Because you're 
you, it seems that you're always sort of a bit ahead of the trend, which is fantastic. Um, I would love to hear, and I'm sure our listeners would love to hear, what do you see as next? The next trends? Um, next trends, yeah. The next trends, well, that's always a hard one, but I, I think uh, restaurants uh, are going away from uh, high end. I, well, I shouldn't say restaurants, I think dining trends are going away from high end in a lot of ways. I think um, lunch is something that has profoundly changed in the past 10 years um, with people not spending an hour or two for lunch. So. I think uh, people are looking for quick options that uh, they can either eat at their desk or eat real quick on the go. As far as dinner goes, I think people are looking for um, restaurants that have uh, a, a range of uh, menu items from uh, different price points. I think uh, you run into real danger um, when you become too expensive nowadays that you just become a special occasion restaurant. Um, I think restaurants really need to offer, you know, with commodity prices the way they are and, you know, especially like your center of the plate food cost items being as expensive as they are for the restaurant to purchase. I think smaller portions are becoming more popular so that you can hit those lower price points. I think, you know, steaks, you know, when I was younger, it used to cost $25, you know, on the menu to forty dollars to forty five dollars you know I, I think now the option of raising prices is going away and you have to start to adjust and make portions smaller uh, so you can uh, have the appropriate price on the menu I don't know if that makes sense, but. no no it makes it makes total sense um, but I must say in, in the city whatever you're trying to go out to dinner it Every place is packed, so it's it's amazing. Um, I imagine you've lived through a few downturns and upturns in the marketplace, and and have had to adjust for those. Have had to, you know, manage through, uh, you know, uh, the issues of the economy affecting the restaurant industry. Do you find that um, what's happening in the economy is a direct impact on eating out and food away from home? Or do you think that's changing and that more people are just eating away from home and less people are cooking at home? Do you have any perspective on that? Well, it's as, you know, being a husband and father of two children, it amazes me how much it actually costs to cook a dinner at home. Um, it's not, it, you know, if you're trying to cook a, a nice dinner at home, it's sometimes almost less expensive to go out and eat. But with that aside, you know, I, I, I think – downturns are challenging for any industry because it's much harder to downsize than to grow. And in, at least in New York and the restaurant business, I think we lag behind. So, you know, when, when there's a economic downturn, we don't really feel the effects till a little bit later. Um, and I think what you have to do is you have to, you have to be, be smart and, you know, watch your trends and, Make sure you can stay. If you can't be ahead of them, stay on you know on top of them and and adjust. You know, your, certain things are fixed, but whatever your variable costs are, you know, try to adjust them as quickly as possible. And I guess your number one variable cost is labor, so you know, try to schedule your labor appropriately. That's great, and I, I think that's really terrific advice. Um, you can you. You personally, I, I think, um, as well as the organization, have have done a lot of things to give back. Uh, you do a lot of work with Meals on Wheels. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, of course. So, you know, see Meals on Wheels, you know, I've been on the board of for almost 15 years at this point. And, you know, it's an organization that uh, has 18,400 recipients, which is just a number that I just happen to know because we had a board meeting yesterday. Um, and it actually ser has served, believe it or not, over 50 million meals. Um, and, you know, our clients are the homebound elderly who literally cannot leave their house. And uh, these meals that we deliver are, for a lot of them, their only interaction with humans, you know, on any basis, you know, is, is the meal deliverer. And, you know, these are, in most cases, volunteers who are delivering meals. In some cases, people who are paid by the organization to deliver meals. 
But, you know, as in New York City, as throughout the country where you have an aging population, um, and a lot of these people, you know, I take my children to do meal deliveries. And when you go to a six-story walk-up where me and my children, by the time we get to the sixth floor to deliver a meal, are out of breath, sweating because it's 90 degrees in the stairway, and you bring a meal to somebody who's 92 years old and you can barely get up the stairs, you know, and you see, you know, the smile that they get. And it's more than the meal. It's, it's having the interaction with people. And, and, you know, these are also ways that people get checked on. You know, if, if there isn't somebody coming, you know, three, four days a week to deliver meals, and the reason why it's three, four days a week is because, you know, on certain days and holidays, you know, we deliver more than one meal that they can put in their freezer. But, you know, this is this is almost, a, it's not almost, it, it, it is their lifeline. And, you know, it's, uh, it's in a lot of ways sad to see the condition that these people live in, but it's also a lot, very rewarding to just try to make their days or just just that much better. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, we've, uh, in a specialty food association, we worked with City Harvest. Um, I currently sit on the AARP Foundation Board, and we address the needs of at-risk seniors. Hunger happens to be one of the critical ones. Um, the fact that people go hungry in this country is, is a, a massive shame, um, especially when you think about kids who, who go, go hungry. Um, what do you think, um, having been in the restaurant industry, the types of things that you feel more restaurants should be doing or could do um, to help from a, a hunger standpoint or a sustainability standpoint and other, other areas like that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think for food waste is a is is a first issue, but I, you know, I, I, at least in our organization, there isn't a tremendous amount of food waste. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if you're running your business appropriately, you shouldn't be throwing out a lot of food. Um, and certainly, the food waste of food that's been served to customer, you know, isn't isn't part of that. But I, I think you have to look at you know, sustainable items, items, trying to put items. You know, fish comes to mind. And, you know, you can have a whole show talking about the different types of fish and the environmental costs of certain fish. You know, just looking at environmental, environmentally friendly decisions of things you put on the menu. You know, and, and it's not lost on me, you know, the environmental costs of, you know, raising cattle and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I think, you know, you can look at your electrical footprint. You can look at your... You know your water usage. You can look at everything about you know you know way you run your business and you know try to make a, as little, I guess, an environmental impact as, as possible. That's that's terrific, um, Matthew. What would you tell someone starting out who wants to get in the restaurant business? What is the key pieces of advice from all of your years of experience that you would say to them? Uh, well. First thing I think is I'd probably get a job for a couple of months working in somebody else's restaurant um, to, to make sure you really like it. But I think the one thing, you know, you have to have a lot of pride and you have to be resilient. I think, you know, pride because if you're not doing it because you want, you want to put out a great product or you, or you want to please people, then it's, it's, it's not the right business. But you also have to be resilient because there are certainly some people who will never be pleased. Um, and you have to learn to to take to to take it on the chin. There are there are people, uh, uh, you know, without going too far on a tangent, who you know have have a lot of problems in life, and they think they can take it out on the, you know, the wait staff of a restaurant. Um, you know, and, and I think as an owner of a restaurant, you have to learn uh, to have your employees back in situations like that. Uh, that's the number one way to get the respect of your team is to, you know, have their back. But uh, I just think it's something you know. Look, it's not a nine to five job. Um, it's it's late at night. It's the weekends. It's holidays when other people are celebrating special events. You're working special events. You know, Valentine's Day. You, know, you got to look at it. It's certainly a lifestyle changing business. Um, you know, I can go on and on, but you know, when go in when with your I eyes open. <laughs> When, when I think about the restaurant business, it's certainly about the level of service and the experience uh, and all of that. And your your people are inc- incredibly important to that. Not only does the food have to taste good, but 
the experience and the helpfulness of the the staff and the greeters and the you know uh, the chefs and so on. How do you do you have what do you do to keep your employees uh, motivated? And a secondary question to that is: Do you still find that there's a certain level of turnover in uh, people who who work in the industry? And have and have you been able to hold on to people a bit longer because of the things that you're doing? Well, yeah. Look, I think once people have been with your organization for a little while, there's a certain amount of inertia once you get over that one or two year mark. We've had, uh, you know, I've had employees and still do have been with us for 20, 25 years. But, you know, I, I think the number one thing you have to make it, people feel like, you know, they're not just at work or at a job, that they're part of something, you know, bigger than they are. There has to be a culture. They have to, you know, especially in a, what I try to get through to people in the restaurant to, to our staff is that, you know, our average check, you know, it can be, depending on the meal period, you know, 40 to $80, you know, people are spending a lot of money there, you know, and we need to respect uh, and, and try to validate that th through their experience. And we want to treat people, you know, our staff in the way we want to be treated ourselves. So, you know, my interview problem, one of the things I, I, I spend a lot of time interviewing people because the worst thing to do is to hire that one person who comes to work every day miserable. Mm. It's just the worst thing, you know. And I always tell everybody, look, I have my own personal problems. Everybody, you know, nobody, there's nobody in this world who doesn't have problems at home or whatever. Right? But when we come to work, we leave that, we, we compartmentalize it. And, it, it, you know, look, and, and, and we all get along and focus on the task at hand. And, and it, it is a very important thing to be able to do. Um, there's nothing worse than that bad hire that is that brings everybody down and complains and so you know uh, yeah I mean it's just very important to morale is the most important thing absolutely you know you also mentioned culture how would um, how would you describe the culture in your um, in your restaurant uh, the first word that comes to mind is collaborative look you know what, the other thing when we hire people is you know Sometimes I'm very wary of hiring that bartender that's worked in five restaurants because they come to work and, and they think their way is better. And that's a, I'm sweeping with a broad brush there. What I'm looking for is somebody who says, look, okay, I, I might have done it other ways in the past, but I respect the way you do it there. I might There might be a bartender we hire that has a better way of doing things than we do it. So come up to us and say, look, hey, I, got, I, I understand that this is the way you do it at, your, at the restaurant here. But in the past, I've done this. You know, what do you think about that? You know, and, and I, I, I think you know, uh, we, we can learn from our employees too and work together to improve the product. It's a big mistake to think that from the top, you know, that we we know better than everybody else. You know, a, a lot of the things we do are from years of experience, but there's there's always new ideas and there's always somebody who's doing something better than the way we do it. So we try to be very collaborative here. And we need to stop a moment to hear from our sponsors. We're talking with Matthew Glazier about creating and running a restaurant and catering establishments throughout the country. You know, it's, it sounds to me like you're very involved in each one of your individual restaurants, that you're not just sort of, you know, sitting in a spot and you're depending on someone else to sort of run the individual um, restaurant. Tell me how much time, uh, talk a little bit about um, how often, how much time you spend in each restaurant each week. Uh, varies by location, but as much time as possible. I mean, uh, we have an office and it's, it's, it's nice, but you know, that's not where our front of the line employees are. Um, and that's not where our customers are. So, you know, as, as much time as possible in different meal periods, you know, a lot of time is spent at the table dining and seeing the experience from our customer's perspective. But a lot of time spent, you know, standing on the line in the kitchen, watching food go out. You know, that, that happens to be my favorite place is, you know, <laughs> expediting in the kitchen. Look, you can never spend too much time in the store. I, I think that's, a fantastic advice because you you can't be sort of uh, 
not not aware of what's going on and and things can get out of control probably fairly easily with with sort of people thinking well they don't care and it's it's clear from everything that you've said that you really care you care about your guests you care about your employees and you you care about um uh the experience that you're providing because people are spending their hard-earned money to to have an enjoyable evening or lunch in in your establishment is there um i have one last question for you which is besides possibly your children what keeps you up at night <laughs> right now it, it, it's uh you know, I think the economy, but I also think, you know, what's going on in the, in, in the world. I mean, it's hard at night when you turn on the TV to focus on anything else. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, the political atmosphere uh, and where we're going. You look at the tax cuts and what, what effect that will have on everything. I mean, that's the stuff, you know, I, I spend you know a lot of time at, at the business and that's what keeps me going during the day. But, you know, late at night, it's, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, current events that, that keep me up at night. Oh, that's fantastic. And we have time for one more question. I hate to break it up because it's been fascinating. No, no. It's, uh, and, and Matthew, you've been terrific, and I really appreciate your time twice now uh, to do the show. My last question, what's next on your radar screen? You know, right now, actually, um, right after this, I'm I'm actually running to go look at another space, a potential space. You know, real estate is very expensive, especially in New York. But uh, trying to find, you know, an, uh, the next perfect place to to start something new. Um, you know, the only thing really getting in the way is is real estate's been very expensive lately. So trying to find yeah. that right deal. Wonderful. Matthew Glazier, um, Glazier Works, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been illuminating and and certainly uh, educational for me and I think for our audience as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very, very thank much. You. Bye. A link to his website will be up on our website tonight. And now it's time for Anne's comment on the trends in today's world. Thanks, John. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about the Amazon purchase of Whole Foods. Um, I was reading a recent Harvard Business Review article, and they're, they're, the way they thought about the Amazon purchase was saying that they basically bought a network of 456 customer-friendly testing facilities, and that those testing facilities welcome 8 million volunteers each week. Clearly, uh, Amazon has extraordinary experience in using pricing online. They use it either as a tool to communicate, to recruit, or to drive value. It's going to be interesting to me to see how Amazon translates that knowledge to the offline retail world, especially when it comes to pricing. Um, you know, Whole Foods uh, struggled in the last couple of years uh, from a perception of being overpriced. Um, it was losing its customers that way, and it was aggressively promoting its 365 brand, which kind of left a little, little less room for other brands. But if you look at Amazon, they essentially sell brands online. And with those 456 stores uh, to use as experimentation, it's clear that Amazon will test varying pricing models to recruit new customers and drive value. So what does this mean for brands? Um, you know, traditional supermarkets are going to find themselves undermined either by the German discounters, Aldi and Lidl, who, who carry very, very few SKUs. Uh, they'll also be challenged by Walmart on value. <clears throat> and specialty stores who, who are all about differentiation to provide unique items not available in other cha channels and to treat their customers as guests. To me, the key will be differentiation. What are the new brands into the market that's really differentiated and desired by the consumer, but still taps into big behavior? Online, Amazon is selling products with brand names, which gives small brands a chance to have an even playing field with large CPG companies who can afford to own the shelf at retail. Maybe, indeed, how we think of the shelf will now change and provide for more opportunities for small brands to thrive. 
Consumers still, they want to know where their products come from, they expect a clean ingredient line, and they want to know that there's a real person behind the product. Hopefully, Amazon will learn this as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. You've been listening to Food & Wine Insider with Ann Daw and Don Mazella. Want to join us on a future show? Contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Until next time, have a passion for food, wine, and profits. And think of our program, Food and Wine Insider.